Ladies and gentlemen, hello. It's Sarah Polak, which is Sarah, just leave the formalities out of this. I don't know what I'm playing at. I'm um, saying hello from the studio of Parallel Polis with the first kind of meaty episode of the Edge of Chaos. Um, so we'll be talking about um, AI and archaeology. The reason is that I am actually like an archaeologist who works in AI because I love few things more than archaeology because I'm just a massive nerd. Um, but also archaeology shows us the beauty of historical technologies and it also helps us understand the place of artificial intelligence in the modern world as well. So. What are we actually going to be talking about today? Well, first of all, the history of mankind, right? Yeah, nice, easy topic, like no, no problems there. Um, I'll definitely fit that into 20 minutes. Um, we then have data collection and analysis. So how artificial intelligence actually deals with the data and archeology span and how we can get very cool insights from that. Um, then there's going to be a bit of a metaphor, AI versus the stone tool, because I do fundamentally believe that artificial intelligence is just a modern stone tool, um, nothing more, nothing less. But actually that means there's a huge amount. It's just like we need to take it a little bit pro more prosaically than some of the media outlets would um, like us to believe. Um, and then finally, again, push the point home of multidisciplinarity. Um, uh, when I told people, when I started crafting my career, if you can call it that, um, two years ago when I kind of pivoted from startup into the popularization that I do now. Um, people found it really weird that someone in archaeology even dares to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, um, I, I know I sound massive like David Brent from The Office here, but um, th there is a connection and everything's connected to everything. Just because these days at university, we tend to separate artificial intelligence or, or the study of it from archaeology doesn't mean that they should be separated. And it's I want to encourage you through this very kind of a huge contrast of disciplines that actually even between them it's possible to find very strong connections. So if we go to the very history of mankind, look at this gorgeous specimen, um, uh, the Australopithecine. Um, he was roaming the savannah and he's got in his hand a stone tool and a bit of wood, which to us is basically like, yeah, come on, mate, you can do a bit better. We tend to call them primitive. But actually the cognitive difference between someone just like climbing the trees and eating like whatever fruit just fell on the ground versus someone thinking, hmm, um, I can't get to the inside of that bone that the lions and the kind of scavengers left behind. Um, so I'm going to use a bit of stone to crack it open and get the bone marrow out so that I can get more protein and so that my brain can triple, quadruple in size. Um, th that was a process that lasted several millions of years. Um, we first see that with Australopithecus afarensis, roughly, um, maybe roughly maybe three million years ago, there's very tenuous evidence, but Homo habilis definitely had it handled by this point with the older one and the Acheulean stone tools onwards. Um, in these stone tools, we might just as well replace them with the iPhone. Um, each and every one of these stone tools is separated by hundreds of thousands of years, sometimes millions of years, or sometimes even just a few thousand years. But you can see them being used for different purposes. Like the first one is basically just like this core that you use to crack something open because your teeth are crap because we as humans are pretty crap. We've got no fur. We're pretty slow. Um, we don't have good hearing. We don't have good eyesight. We don't have good smell. But we've got big noggin. So we're actually able to use nature, um, it, to technologize nature around us to be able to craft these implements that basically help us survive. But if you look at all the way to the other end of the spectrum, when you've got something like a more crafted flint or a blade, or um, you've, you've got like an arrowhead, um, that actually takes knowledge. Like I tried this um, back at Oxford. We used to have like experimental archaeology sessions with Solomon Pomerantz as well, um, saying hi if, you, if you're watching. Um, but creating one of these isn't easy. And I, I've got like, I um, dare say, very dexterous person, but um, it's really easy to get the knack of this. And especially when your livelihood survives on this. So actually creating what the same kind of nonsense that it would be for us to craft an iPhone. Back then it was exactly the same kind of difficulty or maybe not exactly the same, but the principle was the same. That you had to be very specialized in order to be able to create these stone tools um, at scale. They had different purposes. The different stone tools would be used for certain things. And again, it's the same with artificial intelligence. Some methods are better for processing certain data sets more than others. So it's very important to understand the versatility and the evolution of technology through time to be able to see how that maps onto the use of artificial intelligence as well. 
Um, the use of technology and the increased use of things like stone tools and then when we get eventually to the upper paleolithic and we see stone tools not being just used in a utilitarian perspective but also for fun you've got uh, emergence of archaeological evidence that is for example um, s s bones um, that can be used as flutes um, and um, I'd really love to um, pay tribute to the sadly deceased Dr Ian Morley um, who was my thes thesis supervisor at Oxford he's an incredible guy um, he wrote about the origin of of, and the evolution of music, but this evolution of symbolic behavior that simultaneously led to things like forming religious beliefs, but also formed things like creating the scientific hypothesis when you've got something that you strongly believe in and you're actually trying to find a set of ways in which you prove or disprove your point. Um, that partially came from us understanding and systemizing the word ar world around us. So um, this is just some recommended literature from me that I would encourage you to read in order to dive a little bit deeper into the idea of religiosity and the using of technology in the world around us to basically understand the world a little bit better. In principle, um, there's actually, uh, of course there are nuances, but in principle there's actually not that much of a difference between um, like when first writing came along or when the first symbolic behavior came along and you see the first, um, for example, cave art um, and the people trying to process and understand the phenomena around them to the scientists in the Large Hydrant Collider. You're trying to understand the unknown around you and you're trying to craft um, with a certain dose of belief um, the kind of technologies to be able to get those answers and you're trying to systemize um, the data around you, whether that is you not understanding where um, thunder storms come from to you trying to understand quantum mechanics. Mechanics. But where archaeology actually came from, this is beautiful because it is very, very closely connected to the systemizing and the kind of annotating of data that we have to do every day with artificial intelligence. What you see here are the cap is the cabinet of curiosity. Um, it's a Renaissance thing, um, first kind of brought around by the Medici's or like made popular by the Medici's in Florence, for example. Um, but basically you had um, the aristocracy um, that started, you kind of started discovering the world again, again, thanks to technologies where you could suddenly discover the new worlds around you. You could travel all the way to China and find new kind of concepts like gunpowder um, uh, and eventually opium um, that you're able to trade with and kind of function with. But you also started to travel a lot more. You're no longer confined to your village or town, but you could actually go on explorations. And back then, the explorers like um, Sir Francis Drake, they were the pop stars of their age. Um, and if to show that you've been to those places and to show that you're collecting the wisdom and trying to understand the local culture, you'd basically collect all of these random things from shrunk pygmy heads to bits of ceramic to um, looting the odd temple here and there. The British were particularly good at this, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, and then you'd put them into a beautiful cabinet and you'd basically A, show that you're traveled, but you also show that you're categorizing the world around you. And like you'd put a pot with another pot and that's basically where archaeology and anthropology first started emerging. But it's not that different from you labeling data um, in, in, in a modern world where you're basically trying to, for example, have a machine learning algorithm to differentiate between a dog and a cat. You have to label all the pictures of a cat and you have to label all the pictures of a dog. Um, you're actually cognitively doing a very similar thing here, you're annotating the world around you. Um, but you don't only annotate it, you also study it. Um, and it, if we look at a kind of archaeological perspective of the data that you have around you, um, you for example, this is one of the um, ways in which you can analyze archaeologically what you're looking at. So you've got some form of temporal data, so the kind of space that you're the kind of time that you're looking at it. So if you, for example, have a site, like we used to go digging in Marcham in first year, which was an Iron Age slash Roman site, you'd be able to tell with the stratigraphy and like with the various layers that have cum accumulated over time, um, the younger the layer, the younger the civilization. Uh, with, of course, like a, a lot of ifs and buts, like earthworms that kind of churn the earth around so much that they can really ruin stratigraphy sometimes. But roughly, like you're looking at some kind of civilizational um, progress um, in time. So you can study that form of data. But you can also study spatial data. So for example, if you have a hut and another hut and you see a common hearth, for example, between them, you can understand that, for example, those two families were sharing a, a cooking spot. Now, that's something that I made up here because it's just a really easy example, but c connecting and kind of putting into context all the things that you find, both in terms of time and in terms of space, is something that artificial intelligence can help with in terms of simulation, in terms of processing the data and making sense of it and not just like drawing it in a book, which used to be um, uh, in a sketchbook that used to be the practice of archaeology for many years. 
Um, there's also, uh, again, I don't want to go through this diagram um, in detail, but there are, for example, uh, really interesting methods using LiDAR. LiDAR is also something that's being used for autonomous cars, uh, where you use... Um, it's, basically a laser-based system to being able to scan the, the space around you. And LiDAR is used uh, quite a lot in archaeology, especially in terms of um, de-shadowing the canopies of, uh, of rainforests, like in South America, where if you want to find a Maya or an Aztec site, Good luck with that because everything is underneath a very thick canopy of uh, of leaves because like the trees just are completely impenetrable. So you, you use LiDAR where you're basically able to take the shadow out and you're able to simulate what is actually on the ground beneath. Um, so there you see a direct cross-section between very modern technology that's being used for something as cool as autonomous cars, um, uh, and which is basically like a phenomenon of like the last few years, but that is also being used in things um, like archaeology, where you're essentially trying to understand the world around you. And you can see that the real cutting edge technologies of archaeology and artificial intelligence actually have a very close cross section in just the pure kind of methodology that is being used. Um, this is a uh, this is a Czech archaeological database um, where so so this is data um, so this is not artificial intelligence because you're not really analyzing it in any way but it shows that even the collection of data in a digital space can be useful for further analysis um, uh, basically this episode is split into two halves the second half will deal more with the simulation and the interpretation but it also shows that purely digitalizing the archaeological process is very important uh, when we went digging for seven weeks in Botswana um, between first and second year. We, we we found sod all. We we found like a rubber like a rubber boot um from like the nineteen sixties and a couple of beads that we also almost missed and we almost threw them away. Um, but we used to mark everything on like on paper with with a pencil, so it wasn't like exactly a digitalized process. How do you want to run AI on that? You can't because you've got analog data in a scrapbook that like. Good luck doing anything with that. And the thing is, with most modern museums, that's what the archives are full of. It's the work of archaeologists over the last few hundred years or maybe like a hundred years especially when the methodology became robust but you can't run AI on that because it's not in digital form so even though we might not be dealing with AI methods here we're dealing with a precursor to being able to use artificial intelligence in archaeology which is just digitalizing the data and honestly um, in my like experience when I used to work in industry 4.0 you'd come into an automotive plant or like an energy producing plant I used to run across the same problem that they'd be like, oh yeah, we want to use machine learning to predict um, whether, for example, um, if this turbine breaks, like the effect that that's going to have on our production. And I'd be like, okay, great. Well, show me the data that we'll be analyzing. And they'd be like, oh yeah, but like we just make notes in our diaries. And I'll be like, well, okay, well, then you don't need AI. You need to digitalize your goddamn data. Um, and it's just a nice example to show that in terms of um, archaeology, because it's makes, I think, much more of a poignant and interesting case than turbines. If you love turbines, I'm very sorry. Um, this is a more uh, of like a computational method in terms of how you can store the data. So, for example, in, in Postgres SQL, um, you've got the data that's being somehow stored. You can export that, import that. But again, you need to make sure that the data is in a particular format. Um, the types of data that you can have in there, again, is um, you've got the interpretation of the data, but before you can interpret anything, you need to categorize the data into different, like in the cabinet of curiosity, into different bits and bolts. So you might find pottery, you might find animal remains, you might find uh, palynology, which is essentially like the leftovers of pollen in things like coprolites, which is feces. Um, like um, in Pompeii, um, they, they found a lot of really interesting information there. But you need to be able to categorize data before you start feeding it, even begin thinking about feeding it into some kind of algorithm. An algorithm, in its essence, if I'm really to boil it down, is like a mincemeat machine. I mean, you guys probably saw Sweeney Todd, like especially like the Tim Burton one. Very nice, very graphic. Um, but if you've got like the, the guy that's about to be like have his throat slit and put into like the mincing machine, the guy is the data. So it's like botany or pottery or small finds in this case. The mincing machine is the algorithm that actually like makes sense of the data depending on what you're asking of it, whether you want some kind of simulation or you want some kind of categorization or you want some kind of prediction. 
And then the minced meat that then Mrs. Lovett um, puts into uh, uh, puts into her pies, that's the kind of final result. So that's, for example, the interpretation that you're looking at is that, oh, if we find a lot of cattle remains here, that means that likely likelihood of there being like herded cattle and that implication that it has on the kind of social stratification of that particular society is going to be X. Um, a lot of the time it's actually data science more than uh, artificial intelligence, but again, it's good to understand the data flow um, in these regards. But this is actually much more interesting than, um, funnily enough, AI, which is the context um, that archaeology kind of grew up in and the context in which the data collection grew up in. What you're looking at is the uh, Ananurba uh, Nazi expedition to Tibet, which happened just before the outbreak of war. But basically Himmler, who was uh, then the leader of the SS, um, was absolutely obsessed with categorizing people. And he was, as was the entire Nazi party. But actually eugenics originally came from uh, Britain. There was a... Um, Oh, 1902 or 1912, I can't quite remember. But Sir Francis Galton led the first eugenics congress. And then even after that, um, uh, Julian Huxley, uh, who used to teach evolutionary science at Oxford, he was the president of the British Eugenics Association un until 1965. So eugenics is definitely not just a Nazi thing. Um, but you can see that data started to be collected about anatomy, um, imp like uh, implications were being made about that person's genetics, about that person's kind of um, role in society, um, which of course like is... Uh, gross misunderstanding of science and just gross in general but you can see that uh, like before the implications of the Nuremberg trials and the World War II was over um, this was a completely normal way both in archaeology and anthropology to measure the world around you so, so it shows that um, data collection we've been obsessed with it always and we didn't even hesitate when it came to people um, mainly because it helped us justify colonialism and all those joyful things around that. Um, but the importance of archaeology, what I was talking about in terms of the death of the nation states, archaeology always has and always will play a really important role in creating identity. And this is, we're not so much talking about AI methods here, we're more talking about the context. Um, uh, this is Mussolini in one of the uh, Caligula's pleasure ships. Um, basically, he used a ludicrous amount of um, Italy's budget that, frankly, Italy didn't have in the 20s and early 30s to drain a lake and take Caligula's ships that have sunk over the period of time out of the mud um, and sadly they didn't uh, survive the bombings of the Second World War but it was Mussolini's way of showing that he's recreating Mare Nostrum, he's recreating and reclaiming what should have been the Roman Empire or what was the Roman Empire a couple of thousand years before that at its height, at its imperial height. Um, so you can see that nation states have kind of taken archaeology and that data collection that surrounded uh, that process to justify themselves, to create often a very fake, very kind of ludicrous identity. The amount that the Nazis uh, and the fascists, and also in fairness, like the the, the Soviets, spent on archaeology, on uh, creating archaeological sites on basically digging stuff up of, on sponsoring this kind of research they didn't have artificial intelligence back in the day so they needed and they were collecting data just a different way and use that to justify their belief systems and to kind of like force that down people's throat um it's it's maybe a bit of a stretch but it's not unsimilar to what is happening in this day and age as well where data is being used in very warped ways where one statistic can be warped in 20 different ways to be able to convince you of some kind of political agenda or political idea I'm completely apolitical. I used to be political, but then I worked in it too long and I just like realized how ludicrous and fragile it is. So I'm just more interested in the kind of vaster um, uh, kind of archaeological um, contexts um, of humanity and politics for me is just like a tip of the iceberg. That's actually not that interesting. Um, but you can see the huge connection that data and the collection of data, whether it was archaeology or AI, had to play in the formation of not just modern society. Um, uh, Schliemann uh, was a, a massive expert in this as well when he was excavating Troy, when he dressed up his wife in, oh my god, the things that he excavated there. I mean, excavated, literally dynamited a hole until he got to what he wanted. Um, but this was a misunderstanding of data. So, for example, up there, which is the Lion's Gate in Mycenae, which I had the immense pleasure of visiting, he found what he thought was Agamemnon's mask. Well, that was a complete misinterpretation, had nothing to do with Agamemnon, but it's still taught in history books that that's what it was. Um, and again, that's just another way, like if you do a shitty algorithm or if you have badly labeled data in artificial intelligence, you're going to get a shitty result. Uh, so if you tell the AI algorithm that all the pictures of a dog are actually the pictures of a cat, it's not going to know because it doesn't have the conscience. It was the same with archaeology, like big uh, civilizational interpretations were being made on often very, very false data. So it's quite interesting to have this kind of precedent as well. 
Um, and then it, when we talk about politics and formation and belonging, um, this is actually something that's being massively discussed in the new uh, EU uh, suggested regulation from April 2021, uh, where... AI has been largely unregulated because it's evolving so quickly, it's actually very difficult to regulate something that either doesn't exist or is evolving underneath your very hands. But we're getting into like the whole system of belonging, um, uh, the whole idea of some kind of intellectual property. For example, it's uh, impossible to patent softwares in the EU. Um, so, so there are all these interesting things where like, how do you trace the origin of an idea? Um, how do you trace the origin of where something comes from? Um, and the same problems were being faced by archeologists as well. Again, it's more of a matter of principle, but the Elgin marbles in the British Museum where Lord Elgin basically during the Civil War came to Athens, took him, took him to the British Museum and the Greeks have been furious about it ever since. Um, probably rightly so, but it's a very tenuous, very tenuous concept. Um, the, people people want to make sure that they have this latest technology, or that they have this symbol of conquering something, of conquering the truth, of conquering the idea, of conquering the civilization. Um, and it's exactly the same with artificial intelligence, being able to patent a new idea, being able to basically create a new um, methodology, being able to be that person that from whom that method originated. Um, all those things that are often a matter of ego, often a matter of politics, and also often a matter of PR. Um, the Rosetta Stone is, however, perhaps a more interesting example where um, basically Champollion, when he deciphered the hieroglyphics, he was looking at the cartouches, which are the kind of bits of hieroglyphics in the in the little ovals where he was able to take repeating patterns of names like Cleopatra and Ptolemy and he was able to with that un, not unsimilarly to Alan Turing with Enigma where he isolated the phrase Heil Hitler and the weather report that the Nazis used to put in every uh, every message and um, basically decipher hieroglyphics for later generations. Um, again, the Rosetta Stone is, of course, a matter of um, huge diplomatic problems because everyone wants it. The French want it, the Egyptians want it, the British want to keep it, um, although it was actually taken during the time that the Ottomans had a claim to it, but it, that would get too complicated. But you can see that even with these archaeological objects, you're actually looking sometimes at very similar approaches to the ones that you see in data collection and data understanding in terms of artificial intelligence. Um, and finally, what I really want to show you is that um, computation and mechanization and uh, really trying to get that data as accurate as possible, like we had in the first episode, has always been here. This is the Ankitera mechanism. Um, wow, I can really speak well today. Um, that is in the Athens Archaeological Museum, which I have the huge pleasure of seeing. And it's it's like a Swiss watch. It's it's incredible. It was recovered in a shipwreck, and it was basically one of the first kind of recorded computers um, in human history, I think roughly 800 BC, but I, I'd, I'd be lying. I need to double check on that. Um, and it was basically the Greeks using the composition of the stars to, to be able to navigate themselves better because they were a massive seafaring nation because of the way that the Aegean uh, and the islands are, uh, are kind of put together. So you can see that the desire to compute, that, that's not modern. That's been here for thousands of years. And this is why I want to show you that archaeology and artificial intelligence really have a lot in common and that we can see a lot of evidence in data collection and in terms of kind of analysis of the world around you, we can see that um, kind of spanning back, as I say, thousands or even millions of years if we're being a little bit more abstract. But what exactly that means and the exact methodologies and implications that that has for our modern society and why the hell that's even useful, we'll discuss in the second part of this episode, which will be us looking at satellites and satellite imagery, machine learning, and also predicting things like climate change. All right, I'll see you soon and looking forward to seeing you in the second half. Bye.